Uh, uh, hi, I'm Mihir, and I'll, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, uh, all optical uh, quantum repeaters and the challenges we face in making useful all optical quantum repeaters that can beat the repeaterless bound. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with Hari Krovi and Saikat Goha at Raytheon BBN Technologies and uh, Dirk England at MIT. Uh, so there's a fundamental limitation uh, in repeaterless QKD, and that is that the uh, rate falls very fast as the distance of communication increases. And this was discussed uh, yesterday in detail by Stefano uh, and Mark in their talks. Uh, and basically what they say is that uh, in the absence of uh, repeaters between Alice and Bob, uh, the, uh, the best possible key rate in the absence of repeaters um, uh, scales as the transmissivity of the channel, uh, which is eta. And since uh, this transmissi uh, transmissivity uh, decays exponentially with distance, it means that the effective key rate that uh, uh, Alice and Bob have also decays exponentially. And as an example, uh, because of uh, this decay, uh, if your uh, communication distance is 1,000 kilometers between Alice and Bob, you find that uh, you have 200 dB loss. Uh, and without repeaters, the bits per mode rate you achieve will be 10 to the power minus 20 uh, of that order. Uh, and, as, and even if you had a gigahertz repetition rate uh, with such a system, you would find that your key distribution rate would be one bit every 2,000 years. So this is clearly not practical. Uh, practical. So the question is, how can you perform long distance uh, QKD? And the answer is to use uh, quantum repeaters placed between Alice and Bob, uh, which was also discussed in the previous talk. Uh, so the basic idea here is you have these special purpose quantum information processors between Alice and Bob. Um, and what they do is they boost your key rate uh, and allow for secure communication between Alice and Bob without needing to be secured themselves. Um, so the basic uh, idea here, which, was, uh, which is similar to what was discussed in the previous talk, is to have a, uh, have a quantum uh, memory between Alice and Bob. Uh, and, have, and at this quantum memory, you have uh, photons, which are shown here in orange, entangled with memory qubits, uh, shown in purple here. Uh, and what you do is you send these orange qubits between your repeater links and perform probabilistic bell measurement operations. Uh, and you repeat these operations enough times such that you expect at least one of these operations to succeed. And one, once that happens, you end up with entanglement uh, between your two memory qubits. Uh, and uh, once you have this entanglement between your memory qubits, you can perform an entanglement swap at the repeater link uh, to basically connect whichever uh, links were successful, and at the end of this whole protocol, you end up with long-range entanglement with, between Alice and Bob. Uh, so this protocol, which was originally from uh, the, uh, the group of uh, Wolfgang Tittel, uh, was actually uh, analyzed uh, in detail by uh, Saikat Goha and collaborators uh, in detail, taking into account uh, uh, losses and detected dark counts. And what they found uh, was that such a protocol can actually beat the repeaterless bound, Although the scaling of the repeater scheme will still remain exponential, uh, the exponent is improved. Uh, so what I mean by that is initially your QKD rate was scaling as eta. Now it scales as eta to the power s, where s is an exponent that can be uh, less than 1. So for their particular choice of parameters, they found that they can have eta equal to 0 0.28. Uh, and with uh, this kind of uh, exponent, uh, at, at 1,000 kilometers, you can now have a key rate of uh, roughly one kilobit per second, uh, which is a practical rate, whereas previously you found that uh, your key rate was w one bit every 2,000 years. So we can see that there's a massive improvement. However, uh, to date, uh, there has actually not been any demonstration of a, uh, of a repeater which can actually be useful and can actually beat the uh, repeaterless bound. And uh, most of the, and the biggest reason why this is the case is because of the challenges associated with quantum memories. Uh, so. Uh, the quantum memory is arguably the hardest part of this whole uh, protocol, and uh, they are very hard to implement because, firstly, uh, you need to couple these quantum memories with photonics, and uh, most memories work below 1,000 nanometer, and photonics works at uh, the 1550 nanometer band, and as a result, you require a very efficient frequency conversion between these bands to make this work. Uh, secondly, uh, these memories work at extremely low temperatures, so you, need, you would actually need a dilution refrigerator at every repeater station in order to make this kind of scheme work. And uh, finally, uh, and I think this is probably the hardest part of this kind of protocol, is that you cannot actually do with having just a single memory at each repeater node. In order to account for the, um, for the finite coherence time of uh, these memories uh, at each repeater link in a scalable manner, you would actually need error-corrected memories uh, at each of these repeater stations. And as you know, this is a very expensive process. 
So uh, recently, uh, Azuma, Hong Kong Law and collaborators came up with the idea that is it possible to actually replace this, uh, this hard part uh, of the quantum memory with simple photonic elements? Uh, so uh, the basic intuition behind this one could imagine is that imagine uh, we had uh, lossless fiber. Instead of having these uh, photons stored in, uh, these qubits stored in your quantum memory, you could instead store all these uh, photons in lossless fiber and that could be used to, in your, as your repeater. Uh, and essentially what, we, we know, uh, what you should notice is that the job of the memory in all, all this is to basically protect against photon loss. However, since we do not have such lossless fiber, uh, if we were to use lossy fiber, this whole protocol would break down. Uh, instead, uh, what uh, Azuma and Hoi Kong Lo noticed was that uh, uh, we, we could uh, replace these quantum memories uh, by borrowing uh, ideas from cluster state quantum computing. We could replace these quantum memories with entangled cluster states which protect against photon loss. So what you do uh, in their protocol is uh, you have the same orange qubits that are, uh, that, uh, are used to uh, bridge uh, the link between different repeater stations, but now you replace your uh, quantum memory uh, with this sort of entangled state uh, where each of these purple qubits, instead of being a memory qubit, uh, is now uh, a photonic qubit that is, uh, that is, that is composed of this tree-like structure, uh, and this tree-like stru structure actually pr protects against photon loss. And this kind of cluster uh, can actually do both the entanglement swap operation which you required uh, in your memory, and it can also give you protection against photon loss. Um, and they also showed that it is possible to make this sort of entangled cluster uh, using linear optic elements, like uh, uh, sources, detectors, beam splitters, and phase shifters. So now this uh, very hard, uh, experimentally challenging uh, uh, component of the quantum memory is replaced with much simpler elements, uh, namely beam splitters, phase shifters, uh, and detectors. So uh, it looks uh, very promising, but now the problem is that uh, although the elements are, are very simple, uh, linear optical quantum computing in general is notorious for replacing hard elements with much simpler elements, but then you end up requiring a very large number of these simple elements. So now what we wanted to see was, will such a scheme actually be practical? So uh, uh, in the previous uh, paper by Hoi Kong Lo and Azuma, they actually uh, did a point calculation in which they found that such a repeater scheme uh, might work, but what we wanted to see is, what the rate loss envelope or what the protocol would actually scale like compared to the repeaterless bound and what would be the resources you would actually need for such a scheme. So the first thing we did was we assumed that we have, have a, so suppose we had a certain uh, size of cluster available at every repeater node. Uh, we account for all the losses and all the components including beam splitters, phase shifters, uh, waveguides. Uh, we assume that we, uh, we make these clusters in an on-chip ar architecture, so we also account for the coupling loss between uh, chip and fiber. Um, and then for a given number of repeater stations, uh, 50, 100, 200, we see what would the rate loss curve look like. And one interesting thing we notice in this uh, analysis is, is there's always an optimum number of repeaters you want in your link uh, to get the best possible key rate. So uh, intuitively, you might think that it's always better to space the re these repeaters close to each other to boost the key rate, but that's not the case. Uh, because of the fact that we have accounted for a finite failure rate of each repeater station, there will always be an optimum number of repeaters you want in your link. And uh, then what we do is that we actually uh, quantify what the envelope uh, of our repeater performance is with a given cluster size at uh, every repeater uh, node. And what we mean by that is if we, if we were to optimize the number of repeater stations in the link. So from now on, whenever I talk of the performance of a repeater protocol given a certain number of resources, I'm assuming that the number of repeaters in the link has been optimized. So once we have uh, this framework available, uh, w what we decided to do was to analyze what is the smallest uh, repeater cluster that can actually beat the repeaterless bound. And we found that the smallest cluster that, that can do this job for us is actually 208 photons, which uh, looks uh, like a reasonable number. But then when we go ahead and calculate how many photons, photon sources do, would you need firing uh, at the clock cycle to actually make these uh, states using linear optics, we start getting ridiculous numbers. So in our first calculation, we found that you would actually need 10 to the power 11 photon sources at every repeater station for uh, firing in every clock cycle to make this whole scheme work. And furthermore, you'd need 200 parallel communication channels. Uh, and in our mind, this, these requirements are clearly not practicable. And if you were, suggest, uh, if you were to suggest this to experimentalists, they would hate you. Uh, so, uh, 
uh, the uh, the idea is now can you actually make uh, improvements in these schemes to make this sort of scheme practical um, so we decided to make the following improvements to make this sort of to improve this sort of scheme uh, in the original scheme one of the reasons why you need so many uh, parallel channels between repeater stations uh, is that uh, in the original scheme they decided to send each this whole cluster was sent between repeater links um, in order to, uh, in the protocol and this uh, was uh, was done because of the fact that then you would not need any backward communication however the problem with this idea is that uh, uh, you in order to do this you would actually need to send this whole entangled tree of a and a lot of photons through this link and as a result you require 200 parallel communication channels so what we decided was that we'll uh, only send these orange photons between repeater stations uh, and we'll keep the purple error corrected qubits uh, locally uh, and what this does is it reduces the number of channels from 200 uh, to 8 um, and uh, in order to be honest in our calculation we assume that we keep uh, all these photons locally uh, in, uh, in fiber uh, uh, which has the same loss as the fiber which we use between repeater links. The second improvement we made was to use uh, this idea of boosted uh, bell measurement from, from uh, Ewert and Van Luke, uh, which can actually improve the bell measurement, linear optic bell measurement success probability from 50% to 75% by using four ancilla photons. Um, uh, and uh, this really helps our resource requirements because we use these sorts of boosted uh, measurements to build our cluster as well as to join these repeater chains. Uh, we use uh, better multiplexing. Uh, so in linear optics, since all our operations are probabilistic, uh, what we have to do is repeat each operation a sufficient number of times so that we can expect to see uh, uh, the required cluster with uh, near certainty um, uh, once we pick th these successes. So what I mean by better multiplexing is uh, we found a way of actually better organizing how we use our resources and how we repeat these operations in order to reduce the resource count. And finally, there were some points in our protocol where, uh, similar to what you saw in the previous talk where we were able to actually optimize the timing of um, uh, our measurements in order to uh, further reduce the resource counts in our protocol. So now the question is, what kind of numbers do we see when, uh, after all these uh, performances? So now we find uh, in our improved protocol, the minimum, the smallest state that can actually beat the rep uh, repeaterless protocol is now 113 photons. The number of fo single photon sources you would need uh, to beat the repeaterless bo uh, bound is now 3 million. But most importantly, we were able to find uh, uh, that uh, if instead of single photons, our starting point in this protocol were three photon entangled GHZ states, we could actually uh, beat the repeaterless bound and make an, a useful quantum repeater uh, with 15,000 uh, 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 such uh, three photon GHZ states. Uh, and uh, this is interesting because there has been there have been uh, recent experimental results which have precisely shown the experimental demonstration of a state which can make this sort of three photon GHZ state that we uh, want. Uh, and furthermore, you can always tune the size of your cluster to actually get a better key rate. So here I've plotted different curves, and as you go up in the curve, you get better key rates, uh, but you also uh, increase the amount of resources you need at uh, every repeater station. We were also able to find an uh, interesting analytical result uh, in our study, and this analytical result was that the optimum repeater spacing that you want uh, in your protocol is actually independent of the total communication uh, distance. So what this means is that uh, if, if I wanted to go 100 kilometers and I needed 50 uh, repeater stations to get the optimum key rate, if I was to go 1,000 kilometers, the optimum distance would remain the same and the, uh, the number of repeaters I would need would uh, scale proportionally. So you would need 500 repeaters for 1,000 kilometers, uh, for instance. Um, and this was an ex uh, interesting experimental result. So while these numbers are a, are a lot better than the 10 to the power 11 number we had earlier, these numbers are still very da daunting. So we wanted to see, can we improve on this uh, scheme further? So uh, we were able to do this. And so this, this is a new result we obtained after our Qcrypt submission. So even in the short period between our Qcrypt submission and now we were able to find uh, a certain repeater scheme which can actually perform even better and can give us, can beat the repeater less bound uh, with even fewer uh, resources required. So this is a one-way quantum repeater scheme based on the quantum parity code uh, that we worked on in collaboration with Sri Raman Muralitharan and Liang Jiang at Yale. Um, and this is uh, uh, based on the quantum uh, parity code which is a generalization of the uh, bacon shore code. Uh, and um, so uh, this is actually based on an idea from uh, Ewert and uh, Van Luke, where they showed that uh, this uh, quantum parity code can actually uh, help linear optics in two ways. 
Firstly, it can provide protection against loss, but in addition to providing protection against loss, uh, it can also boost the, uh, the success probability of our uh, uh, linear optic bell measurement. So in, in essence, what this kind of scheme can do is actually it can do both the jobs that you want from your code, uh, in, uh, and, you, that you, and that process can be done in the same code. So as a result, we find that now the smallest entangled state that can actually beat the repeat LS bound is a 48 photon entangled state, which is much smaller. And in order to make this state, state you, uh, you, you require 200,000 single photon sources, or you can uh, actually not require any single photon sources and just do this with 1,000 three photon GHG states. So this is a huge improvement compared to the numbers we actually started with. And this, at this point, we feel that we can actually start thinking about actually making this sort of uh, uh, scheme. And uh, we were also able to see that um, if you have access to more resources, you, you find that the, kind, that the communication distance uh, really increases significantly. So for in, instance, with this 18,5 uh, uh, quantum repeater, you can actually get a bit rate of uh, 5 times 10, 10, to the, uh, 10 to the power minus 3 bits per mode uh, at, at, at a distance of 5,000 kilometers, which, uh, which means that if you had a gigahertz repetition rate with this sort of quantum repeater, you could actually uh, be communicating at 5 megahertz at a distance uh, of 5,000 kilometers. And to make this state, you would require 22,000 3 photon GHG states. So uh, now the basic thing we found is that uh, a 48 photon entangled uh, uh, source can actually beat the repeat LS bound. Uh, and in order to make this sort of entangled state using linear optics, we have a reduction fr uh, from 10 to the power 11 to 10 to the power 5 uh, single uh, photon sources at the repeater station, or, uh, uh, or 1,000 three photon GHG uh, sources. And uh, more generally, what this tells us is that uh, there is a lot of room for uh, improving these repeater protocols in order to reduce the resource requirements. And uh, in our opinion, that this is e even this 1,000 three photon GHG number is probably not the final number. And there is a lot of room for further improvement using better error correction and more efficient cluster creation. Furthermore, one, th one point I would like to bring up is that this 1,000 3 photon GHG uh, source is not just uh, replacing one quantum memory, but it is actually replacing an error-corrected quantum memory which, with sufficient error correction to actually beat the repeat LS bound. So therefore, uh, these numbers are, are, were expected to be high. Uh, now finally, uh, we feel that these, uh, our ideas could be applied more generally uh, to linear optical quantum computing and uh, improving the resource costs uh, in linear optical quantum computing systems. Um, so there was a, a result by S uh, Simon Benjamin's group which showed that you actually might require 10 to the power 10 components per logical qubit uh, to, uh, for scalable LOQC. But we feel that uh, since we've been able to achieve such a, uh, a massive improvement for quantum repeaters, if we were to take these ideas uh, to linear optical quantum computing, uh, uh, what, what we hope is that we may be able to actually get a similar improvement uh, in the resource, resources requirement in full blows uh, LOQCs. And, uh, LOQC. and finally, we feel that uh, quantum repeaters could be a much closer and achievable uh, target and a much more natural target for ideas from linear optical quantum computing as uh, compared to full-blown LOQC since photons are the medium uh, for communication for the foreseeable future. Uh, thank you. There's a question. We have time for one or two questions. Paul? Uh, in particular, what assumptions are made? So let me uh, specify a few. So they could be heralded, they could be on demand, and also what the fidelity. So, uh, so we uh, we assume that they are heralded in the sense that uh, uh, that they uh, that every time you ask for a three photon GHG state, you get one. But uh, but the probability of getting the probability of getting a uh, a three photon GHG state is a finite number. And in this case, it would be the, of the, so in this case, of course, we've assumed very uh, aggressive parameters as to what could happen in the future. So you would require like uh, photon sources of the order of 98% or something, but we believe that uh, this number could be, bo could be brought down with uh, better theoretical advance uh, advancements and better error correction. So what about the fidelity of this case? Uh, so the, uh, the fidelity in this, uh, in this case, we have assumed perfect fidelity, but uh, since we have an error correction code, uh, we should be able to account for some uh, some infidelity, but we haven't taken uh, taken this into account in our calculations so far. But we plan to do this in the future. Okay. So uh, I have a very general question. So uh, about the repeat, uh, then. Uh, so how, uh, have you uh, considered 
of using recoil and pulse source. Because uh, even with the spontaneous down conversion, when you increase the uh, uh, rate, you know, so you increase the uh, pump, uh, pump power a little bit, it becomes recoil and pulse. Yeah, so the thing is, that, that's an interesting idea, but we, in this case, we've assumed like a, a dual rail, uh, quant, uh, like our encoding in the, is in the dual rail basis, and so everything here is based on single photons, but that's an interesting question. We haven't considered that yet, and that might be something to look at. Work? Uh, I'm not sure, actually, and I think uh, Saikath has a result in which he says, I think he has uh, one paper in which if you were to use Gaussian amplifiers, he, he has shown that uh, such a thing w would not work. Uh, a Gaussian amplifier would not work, but in general, if there's some other more... Uh, Complicated things would work, I don't know. Saika, do you want to chip in here? Yeah, for, if you use a down conversion source uh, to, to generate these pairs, and uh, uh, you know, uh, and then correctly account for the multi-pair terms that you get from that kind of a source, uh, what we found in a different paper, that uh, if you continue to use single photon detectors uh, at the repeater stations, then the whole thing falls apart. It doesn't work. But uh, this is a paper, this was uh, led by Hari Krovi, is the first author on that. And we, we found that um, if you replace single photon detectors everywhere by number resolving detectors, even with a little bit of number resolution, you can re start retrieving some of the performance um, of, of this. But as Meher said, in our calculations right now, we assume probabilistic sources, but with a probability, when you do get a photon or a GHZ state out, you get a perfect one with perfect fidelity one. All right, let's thank the speaker again.